Great kickoff for our panel this morning, uh, Smart Factory and Industry 4.0 panel. And we're going to invite to our stage Dr. Jesus Jimenez, Professor and Director of the Ingram School of Engineering from Texas State University. And if the panel could come up, because he's going to introduce you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jesus Jimenez, and uh, as uh, you heard, I'm the director of the Ingram School of Engineering. Yes. And I uh, invite my panel to, you know, to be here. And the topic of the panel is um, Industry 4.0 and um, smart manufacturing. Industry 4.0 is a term coined in Europe by the Germans to describe the initiatives to make factories and machines smart, interconnected systems to improve profitability and reduce costs. It brings concepts together like augmented reality, robotics, 3D printers, artificial intelligence, big data, simulation, cloud computing, internet of things. There's a lot of technologies there's a lot of opportunities for innovation in this space. For those of you who are uh, entrepreneurs, the global industry 4.0 market will reach $155 billion by 2024, according to market research uh, data sets. Today, this panel will explore all the opportunities and challenges in industry 4.0. And in the morning or in the previous keynotes, we had the opportunity to learn three different stories. The growth of the industry in this innovation corridor, there's a lot of companies coming to this area and they will bring their industry 4.0 challenges. Also, we heard about the workforce development opportunities, particularly in Texas State and the plant mechanical uh, 4.0. Um, engineering 4.0, ME 4.0 concept. And uh, we also had an amazing uh, use case of the industry 4.0 and all the examples that that is, you know, presenting. With that in mind, um, let me introduce my, my panel. So I've been joined uh, today by uh, Jeep Andrews. He is an industry 4.0 manager at Bitesco Technologies. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Gib Andrews. I'm actually an electrical engineering graduate from Auburn University, uh, coming up on, I guess, 20 years ago, and uh, moved over uh, to work for a company that has now become Vitesco Technology. So in, in one form or another, it's been my uh, same company my entire career. Um, had uh, a good run, actually, in process engineering, uh, so applying uh, the knowledge I had from the electrical side and then actually picking up a lot on the industrial side. Uh, for about eight years and moved into production management, uh, maintenance management for, for three years. Uh, interesting takeaways there is, is uh, Sarah was talking, the, the human aspect is, is really big. You get to see that on the production side, reflecting back on my experience as a process engineering and, and really taking into account how that's affected uh, production employees and then the life cycle side uh, from a maintenance management perspective. And, uh, you really start to see all of the opportunities where we can where we can collect data and make smarter decisions about how we run our run our factories. Uh, past three years, I've been uh, the industry forum manager, uh, responsible for for several different departments at our site, uh, which is located uh, just a few few miles south of here in Seguin, Texas. Uh, so that site, we, we employ about 1,800 employees. Uh, currently, I've got our advanced robotics, AGV teams, as well as uh, a group of uh, systems administrators and software developers. So when we talk about RPA, really you know, replicating a lot of the large data sets we make in manufacturing and, and connecting that data in kind of new and, and exciting ways that take uh, the barrier down for the, you know, the repetition and complexity and, and really helping us make smarter uh, daily decisions so we can be agile. and. I think there's a phrase we use sometimes, it's like, especially I think modern uh, manufacturing has shifted to be very data rich, but sometimes information poor. So that's the opportunity, is how do you transform that into, into business decisions? 
Uh, on the robotics front, we've got uh, well over 150 uh, collaborative and industrial robots deployed in our site, as well as a couple of fleets of AGVs, make good use of additive manufacturing, and uh, now we're actually exploring, uh, especially with COVID, some of the smart glasses, uh, remote uh, uh, interactions, uh, both at our site, uh, cross-site, and with our customers, and uh, really looking at machine learning and AI possibilities as well. Thank you, uh, Jip. Uh, we also have uh, Paul Brown, EVP of, and uh, COO of uh, SQL Energy. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm the mouthpiece for a group of engineers. Uh, I majored in literature and fine arts. Um, you're supposed to laugh at that. Uh, <laughs> uh, we've developed uh, what our clients believe to be the most comprehensive uh, electricity management system. Um, We've installed over 100 facilities over the past 12 years all over the world. Here in Texas, we are the uh, energy management uh, company of choice for the Apple campus in uh, Austin. Uh, we have, uh, we started, kind of started at the top of the pyramid of industries. We now have uh, clients that are, represent the leaders in both uh, technology and hard good manufacturing, as well as process manufacturing foods in Europe as well as uh, fiber manufacturing in, the, uh, in, the, in Asia. Um, we also have uh, healthcare clients, and we just signed our first uh, school district uh, to implement uh, school systems. We start with electricity, but we build a platform that allows for the management of water, uh, natural gas, and compressed air as well. Uh, we've been doing this for uh, quite some time. Our value proposition for our clients is very unique. Uh, we uh, offer them the ability uh, to have us analyze their consumption of electricity across all the facilities that they want to target. Uh, we do a current state and a future state assessment. We develop a, a value proposition and a business plan. We give them a guaranteed baseline for a reduction in uh, consumption of electricity and monetize that. And then we give them a reporting system that uh, allows them to uh, monitor and report not only the consumption, a reduction in electricity, but also the CO2 reduction as well. So I'll pause there and defer to uh, the rest of the panelists. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, Paul. Uh, we also have uh, Tom Lednicki from uh, CFAN. So my name is Tom Lednicki, and I'm a process engineer at uh, CFAN in San Marcos. We uh, sell jet engine parts to General Electric. And really, our digital journey began in the early 2000s when we found that our process yields really weren't where we wanted them to be. And so we started collecting uh, data into databases to be able to analyze it. And over the time frame, we really, uh, really enhanced this capability and, and it grew our database. And basically, through our Six Sigma processes, we had found, we find key X's and then we, our first thing that we would do is digitize these data streams so that we would have access to these, uh, this information into the future. And so we continue to grow this capability and, and really as of today, we have uh, three uh, process digital twins in operation on the factory floor and we are getting ready to launch machine learning by the end of the year on one of those uh, process digital twins. And we are doing some AI for defect detection now. It's kind of rudimentary, but probably over the next two years, it'll be uh, effective, I think. So that's kind of where we're at with our digital journey. Thank you, Tom. Uh, to my right, I have uh, Damian Bayes. He's uh, my colleague and assistant professor in uh, electrical engineering at Texas State University. Thank you. Uh, as Jesus said, I'm a professor at Electrical and Computer Engineering. My main research is I teach uh, and work on AI and, and HPC and embedded systems with engineering students. We definitely look at different uh, applications that require computational solutions, basically. And what we do, what we try to do, is to find uh, best ways to implement this new technology into what we call now uh, edge computing, right? And so the guys, the students that are working with me, uh, not just want the, the fancy names and the resumes to become marketable, but I think to expose them to something that what 
many of the panelists are working on is basically the goal of the education and research that we try to provide. So what we do is that we put them in this situation where the solutions actually do matter, that the research does actually have an application, and they actually understand the challenges and obstacles that not just uh, institutions have or what my research lab will have, but it's basically what uh, companies also face. So when they have that ability and, and capacity to solve those problems, then that's when they become remarkable. So the excitement for me is to become a professor is that the fact that we can actually merge those two uh, ideals of just research and with the application of actually consequence of solution becomes the critical point of like how the, Dean Haley was talking about and how we're trying to modernize our education for our future workforce, especially in Central Texas. Thank you. Thank you, Damian. And of course, we have our awesome uh, keynote, uh, Sarah uh, Huri from uh, Signify. And uh, what she provided today was an awesome um, roadmap on uh, using Industry 4.0 in uh, lean manufacturing context. So um, perhaps the topic of Industry 4.0, uh, you know, has a lot of applications in manufacturing, but there are also lots of connections to uh, hospitals, um, utilities. So the applications areas are increasing and expanding to other sectors. So uh, I guess what we want to do first is just to start by identifying, you know, the opportunities of Industry 4.0 within our factories, as well as the challenges. So, for instance, one thing that comes to my mind is uh, understanding what changes inside the facility are needed to enable smart manufacturing environments. So, who wants to take that question? What are the changes needed to enable smart manufacturing in your, in your factories? So, yeah, I'll comment a bit just from, from our experience. So the, the plant we're at, so we've been doing electronics there for, uh, I think, longer than I've been alive. There, there's somebody that uh, celebrated like a 45th uh, work anniversary the other, other day. And uh, anyway, that, that industry's transformed over time. But so you've got a plant that's been um, in one shape or a form existent for a long time. And uh, brownfield applications like that where you look and say, you know, how do I, how do I you know, A, get the right uh, inspiration? So I think you have to start at the top and get your top management engaged, because if, if not, you're not gonna have the support, right? And, and I think networking and realizing that as an engineer, it's, it can be really exciting. You may, you may find a technology that, you know, this solves all your problems, but being able to convey that and translate it and, and really attach uh, the right stakeholders early on. So IT, uh, I think Sarah commented, so yeah, that, that can be a barrier. And, and I think uh, understanding to get, get those teams involved. Cybersecurity is, is as important now as it is ever and it continues to, to grow. And, and so their, their concerns aren't unwarranted, uh, but getting those people involved, engaging with your production teams, making sure uh, the value proposition isn't just money, right? Look to your production operators, make sure they see that what you're doing is gonna make their job easier um, so that, that they can buy in, right? And I think, you know, as I mentioned, I learned a lot listening to those guys. It was, it was interesting as a, as a younger engineer, I came out somewhat arrogant, I would say. Like, you come out, I've got all this education and I know everything. And then you finally stop and listen a bit and you realize people have been doing that job for years, know so much more, and there's nuance to what they say. And your understanding of their problems may be incorrect. So, so I think really taking that, and I think the thing I've learned working with our software developers is, is really, you know, on one hand, it is important to have a vision and an overall idea of where you go. Um, but it's also uh, maybe equally as important to not get overly committed and be structured and rigid to that plan and make, take small steps, right? So experiment, uh, don't be afraid if you fail, but limit the, the magnitude of that failure. Um, and I think uh, that, that philosophy um, really, really has helped us get, uh, and you learn stuff along the way, right? So you may find that the path you take is you, uh, from your Hoshin Connery or your North Star vision may actually shift a little bit. And as long as uh, you're using data to, to drive that decision, maybe that's okay, so. Right. I, I can add a little bit to that. I, I mean, we, uh, just a really small focal point in that, that, that uh, comment there, when we try to do uh, digitization on the factory floor, one of the really goals we try to do is, is minimize the effort that the production associates have. So our our concept is always to reduce 
the labor content or reduce the effort that it takes by them. So if we say, hey, we want you to collect this data, you know, they might be collecting it now with pencil and paper, which we're trying to avoid, but the idea would be let's try to make that automated, let's try to collect that data in some sort of either wireless fashion or in some sort of, you know, have digital calipers that are wireless or uh, have the data automatically uploaded from a process instead of having the engineers or the engineers having to go convince the operators on the floor, we really need this data. It almost becomes um, transparent to them. So that's our goal is to make this data collection and the analysis and, and the use of this data transparent to the people on the shop floor. I would so, say that can be kind of almost a catch us like fire once you teach people those tools as well. You're going to get so many new ideas that uh, they can start to see how it applies, right? right. So, hmm? and, and I think, you know, when we talk about the escalation of that, make sure your databases are ready for all that, all that data because it really adds up fast. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's a big, um, a big point, the database, and the, sometimes we collect the data, and, but we don't realize it's also a, a lot of expense just to maintain the data and, mm -hmm. and uh, even, you know, uh, keep it secure and make sure it, 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 it is uh, blocked from, from security, security threats, so excellent. Uh, what, 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 what are your perspectives, uh, uh, Paul? on, you know, challenges of implementing smart uh, industry 4.0 systems? Well, I don't think there's any question that there's a tremendous amount of pressure on cost and uh, profitability in, in any organization uh, in this current time. Um, we've been able to facilitate uh, an, an integration in uh, operational improvement as well as uh, sustainability or conservation. Uh, we started with electricity. Uh, because we collect data that um, monitors and collects uh, information on the consumption uh, at each uh, load, at each circuit, and, in, and the entire network uh, across the facility, um, we're able to then track uh, opportunities for operational improvement. Uh, our technology improves the operational characteristics of uh, all the inductive loads. Uh, which then translates into cost savings relative to maintenance and repair and, and extension of the useful life of the equipment. Uh, that data, that motor control data, uh, can then be analyzed uh, to use for process improvement. Um, uh, and that's really the engineering uh, magic, I think, relative to uh, our interface with our clients. Excellent. Uh, Sarah, you mentioned in your, in your talk about how your, your, your Signify, your company, has lots of sites all over the world, particularly North America, uh, Mexico, South America. And then you showed us a, a roadmap on, you know, how to implement uh, Industry 4.0. What, what are the challenges to, you know, talking to different people and make sure that the roadmap is uniform or, or it can be deployed effectively? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question because, as I mentioned, that um, it's usually when it's one getting sites together to actually talk to each other. That's usually because everyone's in their little silos. But those, those forums that we now have where we're focusing a lot of efforts on our, uh, on our best practice sharing and having that forum for this, our global smart manufacturing council and then a regional, that's helping to standardize or at least you know, people are talking to each other to say, hey, what are you doing, what are you doing, and how can we, you know, collectively implement something. Still, a lot of sites are at a very, you know, novice level where sometimes you don't know what you don't know, and they may not know what's out there. And I think that's a challenge in itself. They don't know some of the technology that's out there because it's relatively new within, um, within at least our business, um, from going from such a manual environment to now incorporating some of, the, some of the automation we never thought of before. Excellent. And uh, Damian, you're an uh, AI expert, so you have the opportunity to you know, work with all these technologies. They're advancing very fast. There's a lot of development. There's a lot of uh, competing needs. But how do we communicate that to our uh, industrial partners? How do we tell them that could be a challenge? What kind of things 
you know, they need to implement in their factories so that they deploy AI effectively? That's an interesting question, right? Because I don't have my own factory. So the challenge I have <laughs> is that I have students, right? And, and students then go to the work first. But if we need an immediate communication venue, uh, dissemination through research doesn't really help. Um, because when we have graduate students, when we have the undergrads going to the workforce, one of the things that we need to help students learn, not just the technologies changing, which is a funny story because my classes were outdated yesterday, right? When I taught class yesterday, I found out one of my slides was outdated and it took like two weeks, right? Like the change happened from one week to the next and my lecture was outdated. So I'm having that problem in the classroom as it is. So the, the important key skill that I think an engineer needs to learn besides what technology is out there, they have to actually learn how to research that technology constantly. And, and I think the communication will then have to be done by those who are selling that technology. And, and I think uh, that's the, the pipeline in which everybody can benefit of modernizing or extracting all that data collection and what to do with that data. Because the challenges are coming in floodgates. And so the pro the, the what companies are trying to provide is a plug-in solution, so if that works for you, and is that constantly changing, is that going to be something that's going to help you or not, that's going to require some research. So the, the ability to understand the incoming information and dissecting what you're actually trying to accomplish are skills that have to come from not just the individual company that's doing that, but it's actually what kind of people you're bringing in to actually do that in the long run. And so that my job as a professor, I think it's, it's having to deal with that balance of not just teaching them concepts, but it's actually developing the skill in how to improve that concept. And, and in the age of, of phones, I think that's the problem that I, <laughs> I see with, with, with the college kids, right? If, if you can modernize your data collection by swiping right or left, that would be the easiest thing for them to do. But it's, that's, <laughs> the reality is we don't collect data that way, right? Only Facebook does that. So we have to, m maybe in 20 years, that would be the easiest way to do it. And maybe because they were brought up in doing that, right? And they'll find a plug-in to, to change that. But the communication has to be through the, the same people that sell you that technology. It's just that simple. And then the research is, will you trust them? And, and that's gonna be the other critical question because when, when you hear the news of people getting hacked and your data's with them, what are you gonna do, right? Uh, I know you're under pressure of getting and in, in, in modernize your plant, but at the same time, what are you gonna do when that happens? And so there's, there's risk to everything, but I think it's worth uh, exploring some solutions that as we go along, things will be stable enough to hopefully gain that trust. And every generation will have more trust on it than, than we ever will, so. You, you, have, you have put a very good point, which is workforce development. Yeah. And I think uh, you all agree that in your systems or in your own factories uh, or, or companies, you have the challenge that as, you, as you're integrating things like IoT, augmented reality, then you need to train the workforce to do those kinds of things. So what is your perspective in, in, in your companies about the training for, 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 the, for the new technologies? What, what are you doing or what can be done uh, in, this, in this space? So yeah, in which capacity are you asking the question? Are you, are you asking, uh, for instance, down to the production operator level, or are you talking more of a technical basis of, of you need to seed that knowledge amongst your engineers? I think the, the op operators level and also the engineers, how do we keep them you know, updated sure. uh, as well? So. Yeah, so, so at least at our location, we, we did, uh, the software developers we have actually did a pretty good job of developing a, um, a training module. It was out of, out of a necessity. Uh, where we just didn't have a very good system. And, and uh, the challenge now is like, how do we take that and scale it globally so, so that you do have a, a more standard solution? But uh, those training modules are, are linked back into uh, 
HR data that we replicate, which are tied to production supervisors and their dot charts. So you can Im immediately get analytics of you know who's been trained on what, where are our weaknesses, what do we need to reinforce. All of those work instructions and videos are, are digital. Uh, some of the new stuff we're exploring are like uh, the uh, HoloLens, for instance, gives you an augmented reality, and and you could take stuff, for instance, if there's a a PM procedure on a piece of production equipment. We can now have uh, a work instruction that literally you can wear with you to the production floor. And if you haven't played with that, that technology is really, really fascinating because that work instruction sits in space and you can you can pause it here while you do work and turn and it's right there and, and the next steps are, uh, are readily available. Um, and, and a lot of the tools, so, so the package we're currently working with there actually runs analytics on the backside to see on a per user basis, like is this person really familiar with it? Maybe I don't need to show them this full long, because again, socially, that person probably is gonna tune out. They aren't gonna wanna watch the whole thing. There may be critical details they miss, right? So I, I think there's some opportunities there. Um, global, uh, I would say, technical groups and regional technical groups uh, are value for the engineering side. So again, the best practice sharing is really, really important. Um, our organization uses Microsoft Teams, which uh, there's, there's tons of different uh, ways you can collaborate there, but, but teams and subgroups there for, for specialized uh, uh, interest uh, does help. Um, you can take, uh, also I think we try and gamify stuff so there can be competitions between sites, like what are your best projects, and, and really try and uh, motivate that, or motivate your, your, your teams really to showcase uh, their best, uh, best solutions. I, I do think the comment earlier uh, about uh, geographic considerations for solutions, uh, there isn't a one-size-fits-all. The things we decide here for automation aren't necessarily going to be as valuable in other places. So, But you also learn stuff from, because uh, the, uh, to use a, an evolutionary term, the selective pressure or the, the, that are driving those decisions are different in those different environments, but that doesn't mean you might not learn something valuable through that sharing process, right? So, um, yeah, that, that's just been our experience. Excellent. Yeah, I, I think um, that I can add a little bit uh, once again to this. I mean, our when we talk about the people on the shop floor, the production associates, our main uh, uh, thrust at the moment is to, to work with them. We really want to have feedback from the uh, uh, people on the shop floor every day. And But our goal here recently has been to train them more in some problem solving so that they kind of are engaged in that problem solving. So when we get into... Uh, we get working together in a collaborative environment, then they feel comfortable bringing up the ideas and they, they understand that we're using these statistical processes to our calculations to understand, hey, is this good or bad and, and why? Uh, so we're, we're always working on the, the development of the workforce. But on the, the engineering and quality side, the staff side, we're, you know, we always uh, focus on Six Sigma techniques. techniques. We, um, we always interact with data on a, uh, you know, all of our decisions are data driven. We, the, it's just not in our culture for someone to stand up and say, I think it's this. I mean, people will say why right away. I mean, it just doesn't, it doesn't happen that way. You know, it's, so that's our, really our culture there. So you have to come to the table with data. And so we've set up the ability to use data every day in our decision making processes. Um, we talk about uh, our we talk about our software development, and you know we don't have a software development core team at our facility. So we partner with with uh, another company that does our development for us, and we've been working with them since 2006. So we have a kind of an integrated partnership with them. That and we also rely on uh, General Electric. A lot of our uh, AI stuff is coming out of their corporate. Uh, research groups and stuff. So we, we kind of feed in from multiple directions and, and use what resources are available to us. So. Thank you. Uh, uh, Paul, your perspective? Well, I, th I think fundamentally it, it, uh, the concept is pretty simple. Um, uh, workers at all level, um, at, at this current time anyway, desire to understand um, what the objective is of whatever the process that's in place. Uh, and what their contribution can be. So if you understand uh, your role, if you understand how that plays into uh, the overall uh, uh, process and the objectives uh, and the goals, and then have the um, um, empowerment uh, to make decisions, as has been uh, mentioned already, is really the key. 
Um, so again, fundamentally, it's pretty simple. It's more difficult to implement, but uh, there's lots of innovation in process right now. Oh, one thing I'll add that, so this has just been a personal development for me over the past few years, I think, as a manager. And, and really, there was some reflection on as I coach people. And really, you want to coach and develop and, and allow people to grow. And it's easy to get caught up in the day-to-day. -day. And, and I think especially as a younger manager, it was like more like, hey, these things that ha need to happen. And you, and you want maybe too much control over your organizations. But how do you back away and, and, re and let people have creative freedom? Because really, when it comes down to it, that's what you want. That's where the passion is going to come in and the learning. It isn't people listening to my answers. I've got seven departments. There's no way I'm going to know enough about all of those things to drive that the right way, right? So backing up, giving people enough room to explore their ideas, and I think most importantly, leave a mark so that when they come to the plant, they can look and say, that was my idea. I owned every piece of that. I, I left my thumbprint there, right? So, so I think to me that's been, I think, an, an effort to, to really start partnering more with my, my people, say, hey, we have large objectives we're trying to do, but I want to give you the freedom to personally explore your, your thoughts and, and let's transform things that way, right? Because it collectively, you get so many better ideas if, if, it's a, if it's a group and if you can support those ideas the right way, so. Sarah, your perspective on the workforce? So, one, so we do have um, in our, especially in our Canadian and U.S. sites, a lot, of the, a lot of the people have been there for a long time. But then when you look at some of our sites in uh, Mexico or South America, we have a lot of like high turnover. So we do have some automation in those sites and then making sure that we have training programs that are um, that are that are easy to, you know, to to make sure that we're able to, with the with the amount of turnover that we actually have, able to get these people in, get them um, get them up to speed quickly is sometimes a challenge, and we've seen that um, a lot with some of you'll look at performance data and then you'll say, well, okay, what happened? They say, well, we've had a lot of high turnover. So things that we taught people previously, now they're out the door and we've got to reteach, reteach. So how do, we, how do we have such a training program to get people up to speed as much as possible, but then also you know, get them to understand what their purpose is, what they're doing, um, and then some things that they maybe never encountered before, especially with some of the automated equipment that might not be something they've ever seen. So being able to look at it from their perspective of how can we make it easy for them to learn, adapt, and then also give them all those visual aids to make sure that they're supported. One of the things I would add in our experience in working with companies around the world, uh, uh, the suggestions uh, have to take in the, the cultural orientation. Uh, of wherever the uh, facility might be located. Uh, we've seen dramatically different uh, approaches and attitudes uh, by the workforce um, in uh, uh, Central and South America as opposed to in the Asia as opposed to, to Europe. And there are also labor laws and other governing uh, issues and challenges that have to be managed. But again, the innovation is there. It's just a matter of adapting to the environment. Excellent, excellent. Uh, also, I want to give the opportunity to the audience to uh, ask questions. If you have any questions, there's a microphone there. Feel free to interact with the um, uh, panelists at any time. And, uh, you know, from the Industry 4.0 pillars or technologies, which one do you think, if you were to say this is the most promising technology, which one do you think that is? Uh, Augmented reality, additive manufacturing, big data analytics, cloud computing, cybersecurity, Internet of Things. I have uh, robots, cobots, and simulation. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to pick one. <laughs> you can go down each one of those and like you know, additive manufacturing. Like you can easily see a future where like you don't assemble things anymore. You just print them, right? Like, like, okay. like that's just like those, you can see the same thing with digital transformations and AI, like you get data and like the insights you may gain, you can't even conceive those today, right? So like, <laughs> I don't even want to venture to guess which one of those is going to be. But they're all going to, and, and I think that's the important thing, is they're all going to interact with one another and, and support one another, right? They are pillars of kind of the same, same concept. So yeah, right. I, I don't think any one of those is necessarily going to be head and shoulders right. above the others. Right. You know, yeah, that's what I, I agree when, you, when you're going through the list. I was going, well, they really all work together, you know, and, and even in the keynote address, you know, you look at each one of the, the your processes and what you're trying to improve, improve and you just 
say, well, this apply, this really applies. I really want to automate this one because it, the human factors of that particular uh, operation are really poor. But so you want to automate it, right? Um, but you know, you also have to think about when you're digitizing something or you're trying to build in a new process. You also have to think a little bit about the return on investment. Okay, you at some point in time you have to say, well, the product that I'm making is not doesn't have that much value in it. You know, so that you can't in in every case you can't say I'm going to completely automate that or I'm going to completely build up the you know a digital system to support that. You have to also make be realistic about your profit margins and your process yields and things like that. So it's it's really an economics decision on some of these. So you, I think what we'll find and what we've been finding is the really high value added manufacturing environments or say hospital, hospitals or energy or things like that, those are gonna be the ones that are gonna be the early adopters and then they will be the ones that drive the cost down so the, so the next tier below that will be able to use, uh, take advantage of this, uh, of these smart factories in, in digital world, so. That's the one, that's the one. Paul, any? No, I absolutely agree. Uh, the cost pressures and, and pressures on profitability are tremendous. And then everybody's now being influenced, uh, again, from a cost perspective, uh, socially, as well as uh, government regulations relative to sustainability, so. Uh, it really boils down to the analyses and and uh, what the ROI uh, or the or the short term as well as long term benefit uh, how that can be quantified. And uh, we have a question, but I wanted to give you the opportunity to identify technology. I guess for right now is because it's a hot topic, at least within our in Signify. One of the things, of course, I'm sure everyone is dealing with is you know the supply chain as far as having a lot of trouble getting components and parts in. One of the things that we have found beneficial is some of our sites have 3D printing so and additive manufacturing, so we've been able to leverage those technologies to help us uh, with you know, lessening the impact of those component shortages and helping and, and enabling us to serve our customer as, we, as, we, you know, as they expect. So that's been just in the short term beneficial, but perhaps there's something there long term as well. The man, uh, AI, or? <laughs> well, I, I would be biased to AI, but, but <laughs> none of the pillars get done without money. So the, the, the economic question is, is the, the unmentioned benefit of where the common denominator is. I think the other non-mentioned pillar is people, right? So you, you cannot do those pieces if you don't have the right people doing those specific things. So money and people are the ones that are mainly the pillars of all those branches that I think will define Industry 4.0, really. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you for, your, for approaching the panel. Uh, please ask your question. Maybe you can state your name and, and organization that you represent. Sure. Um, hi. Morning. I'm Kumudan Grab, and I'm a full-time worker. <laughs> I work for Texas Gas Service um, as a GIA. GIS analyst, and I'm also a student at Texas State University. Uh, my question is, uh, what would Industry 5.0 look like, and when do you think that's coming? Oh, that's, that's an excellent question. <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> well, I think it, it, the jury's out on still 4.0, and uh, it, it will be uh, sometime um, hopefully sooner than later uh, that we'll begin to totally understand uh, the impact uh, for the reasons we already mentioned uh, of implementation of the ideas and technologies that are on the table right now. And as uh, the professor said earlier, it only takes a week or two uh, before the things that we have uh, considered to be appropriate um, are uh, replaced by new ideas, new concepts, and new technologies. Again, uh, this environment is uh, evolving all the time. So I think uh, 5.0, uh, who knows what it's going to look like or when it's going to come, but I don't think it's going to be very long, and I think it'll be impactful. Yeah, I think we're actually 
with AI starting towards that direction, right? So Industry 4.0, in, in truth, a lot of that was where you, you know, historically had a lot of data being generated by your equipment, and, and maybe you were fortunate enough to have this stuff being pumped into databases, and, and now you're starting to, to gain, again, you're transforming that data into information. But I think what you're going to see is a lot more interoperability between those data sets. Uh, some of that right now, uh, in fact, a lot of the stuff we do right now is, is manual. So you've got some domain insight and we realize that there's a relationship between two or three data sets from different data sources and maybe we can manually connect some of those and gain some insight. Uh, you know, business intelligence, Power BI, for instance, has really lowered the barrier and the complexity of making some of those visualizations once the data becomes available. But I think where you'll go and is maybe AI literally starts drawing a lot of those connections from things that, that maybe we don't currently see today. And I think that there's a lot of fuzziness, at least for me, and I know, I know for, for management, like it's, that's the AI can solve everything, and, but there's some problems it's really not suited to solve yet. So like, I think you're gonna start seeing a lot of advancements there, maybe to the point of, of actual artificial intelligence, which comes with all the scariness on the backside of that, but uh, you, know, you don't make strategic or business decisions with AI, for instance. Like that's just not what it's meant to do. And I think there's still a, a big human component. So the, the veracity of the data you're using to pump into those models, for instance, you can have a, a machine learning algorithm that'll be completely wrong if you haven't really done the human part to validate that the data you're pumping into that model is, is really, really true. Or if you oversample the data, right? Like then you can have something that works for every case except like now there's this one little tiny change in the system and it just, I shipped a thousand bad products, right? So for something that had been working great for, for months, right? So there's still a, a big human component. I think you'll start to see some of that, um, that, that margin maybe narrowed down and then, and then people then are, are left to look at, at what those next problems are, so. Okay, I guess I'm on. So this is, a, this is really a tough question. I, you know, I keep thinking, you know, when we're just now uh, looking at machine learning and AI, and we've, we've clearly said we're not going to let the AI make the decisions in our process. We're, we're going to look, it's going to identify trends and, and, and find key things that we need to manipulate, but we're not going to let it actually flip the switch. Okay, so maybe allowing AI to, to let it go, let it do what it wants to do. So that's one of the things that I might be, could imagine would be part of uh, Industry 5.0 to have actually AI doing process control. Yeah. I, I still think you have, you're gonna have to have the human side monitoring that AI, but yeah, yeah I think you're right. Yeah. Well, we don't allow it today and, and nor will our customer let us mm -hmm. even uh, allow us to do that because we've had this idea that well we can pick a process a B or C and let the AI decide okay which one's going to give you the best but right now it's no the engineer or the quality person says okay AI is saying B is is the one we should use and then they verify it and then they hit B okay so that's I think maybe that's one thing the other thing is we've been using a lot of uh, I think there's going to be improvement in numerical methods uh, we're, you know, up to now we've been using finite element modeling as our mainstay for a lot of what we do. We, we've been doing kind of a next gen um, uh, numerical methods called a PGD or proper generalized decomposition. And this, this type of methodology allows you to do, have kind of the power of numerical methods or, or finite element modeling, but we can do that more on a, a PC or even a, a handheld. So I think that a lot of, you're gonna find numerical methods are gonna be available uh, to the guys, on, people on your, on your phones, you know? So I think we're gonna see uh, the ability to model complex situations down uh, to the individual level. And I think I can see that as part of uh, the next uh, level of, of, of 5.0, if you will, and, and those are the two things that I kind of see where things are leading to. And, and, and you know, that we, we all know, you know, energy is going to be a key thing. And so I think part of really true energy management, uh, you know, I think that's where it's across the board and everything we do is, is going to be part of uh, Industry 5.0. I, I just keep thinking about this uh, uh, motor management that I thought, well, that would, that's the kind of thing I think we're going to be doing everywhere. In every house, 
in every uh, motor, in every vehicle, everywhere. Those are going to be the kind of things we do. And that, I think that's what we're talking about. And, and I was in a, in a conversation with a group uh, a couple of months ago. And this is precisely what, how they define Industry 5.0. 5 Personalization, customization, and sustainability, the environment, the energy component. So, Sarah, what, what do you think those dimensions I, I are? I agree with what everyone says. <laughs> I haven't, I honestly haven't thought that far ahead. I don't have a creative enough uh, answer there, but um, I, I guess definitely it's just going to be a whole learning process in general. So, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm still, I'm, I'm in no expert by any means and everything that's out there, but um, really just kind of seeing where the trends are, um, getting as much information as possible, and then eventually coming to that conclusion, honestly, to be frank. So. Amen. Well, before okay. you go, and maybe you can talk about this also, I asked this question yesterday, I wasn't very satisfied with this answer, with the answer of the panel, uh, but about unsupervised learning in AI. You know, uh, how do you think, you know, with, with Industry 5.0, probably that might be more dominant, uh, where you're not getting uh, user feedback, you're, you're not depending on, uh, you know, supervised learning as much. What would that look like, and how do you implement that? And maybe that's part of Industry 5.0. Uh, just going to add. Right, so we, we see a lot of unsupervised approaches to many of the engineering applications, mainly because it's shown the effectiveness of how accurate it can be. I think what, what us as humans, when we see results like that and they're hard to explain, uh, it's gonna be hard to trust, right? And so I always give in my class the, the, the oncology example, right? If your doctor tells you you have cancer because the AI machine told it so, what are you gonna do as a patient? Right, and so the the the, the decision making of, of the, or, or the or what is the mentality of you as a human is because a machine said so, and so I think it's a generational answer to be honest, because I think generations in the future are going to be far more acceptable than we are in this room, and so uh, there's no answer, an absolute answer to that. It's just the fact that. Can you explain it or not? And at the end, can you trust it or not enough that you want to put funding on it, right? And, 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 that, and that's, that's going to be not just the driver on supervised learning. I think reinforcement learning will be the stronger one out of that because then you're going to have real machines just doing it all, right? And, and, and talking about let the AI just run the show, unsupervised learning is part of the small component and mechanism of that. And so reinforcement and the level of, the, of those things are going to be the ones defining industry 5.0. But I think if you follow the trend from the previous industry versions, if you follow any trend, that, that means that the next generation, the next pillars are things that we're not even talking about, right? They don't actually exist, or maybe we haven't even said the word. But in industry 4.0 will be one single pillar for the next generation. When, that, when you brought up that question, since I had to imagine how that would look like, part of it is, yeah, AI will take over, but it's not just taking over, it's gonna use like quantum computers to take over. Yeah. I, I, think, I think the decision the machine will make, it's all gonna be done in one decision. The, whatever decision it's going to make, it's already efficient, it's already optimized, it's already secured, it's already remote. And that's just one pillar. The other, four, the other four or five, whatever is going to be defined, is the customization, scalability. All those things can be defined however we want to define them. I think AI will define it for us. And so maybe I'm very Disneyland about this, right? But, but you know, again, I think more components that, that fit in right now are just going to be a singular pillar going, uh, moving forward. I hope that was a satisfactory answer to you this time, so <laughs> thumbs up. Excellent. Thank you. We have another question. Too. Hi. Good morning. Um, I, I uh, work a lot, of, a lot with workforce. I'm the executive director of the Greater Brownsville Incentives Corporation. It's very, one of the things that we 
we, I think we're doing right is that there's a lot of intergenerational workers that stay on manufacturing plants. Right? That's something that if you treat, going back to culture, if you treat them well and you, they see a path forward, normally they stay right, and their kids stay in. Um, and some of these companies, such as Rich Products, has had one of their best revenues you know, of their history or career during COVID um, because of agility and innovation and, and some advanced manufacturing. However, when I talked to the Texas Southmost College, which is one of the oldest colleges, tech colleges are the oldest in Texas, and how they're trying to upskill their workforce and our workforce. We have SpaceX there with the South Launch sites, um, hiring hundreds of, of welders and, and engineers, and then what's to come. You know, how are, where do you partner at all with your tech colleges? How are you, how do we do go about, you know, introducing them? We're looking at an innovation hub at their center for technology, but bringing in industry partners to see what we need, because we don't want to go in the wrong direction. So I think, you know, and then we talk about how um, technology advances so quickly. You know, here we are, if we're spending money on 3D printing or drone technology or, you know, how should, how, you know, is there a good recipe out there? Um, you know, are there recommendations and suggestions as we go about this journey um, to really upskill our labor? Thank you for the question. Who wants to okay, me? well, I'll, I'll take this one, I guess. So our, our company really has been uh, in business and investing in our labor force since the, like, early 90s. And, and really, we, we have, Families that have grown up there, and 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 now we, you know, we have multi, you know, maybe three generations of, of people uh, that work at our company, and and I think when we talk about building up, you know, I mentioned this earlier, you know, we are trying to have a, a agile workforce that is that really is involved and engaged in uh, problem solving. We do a lot of uh, lean training with them, so you know. Having them understand lean and understand, understand why it works and how it works is, is really important to us. Um, when I first started working there, uh, and, and, and really well into the 2000s, people, a lot of people weren't that comfortable with uh, computers, really. I mean, and, and now, uh, all of our workstations, we don't have any paper instructions. You know, that everything's by, the, by a computer. I, I can see having them comfortable with um, uh, you know the common technologies of the day and, and the next generation where we're doing uh, you know guided uh, guided instructions and um, so that's the kind of thing I think is important to us. We um, you know we're always wanting to have one of the we just had an audit by the. Um, by the FAA and, and General Electric was down there with them and, and their comment was that our workforce was so engaged and so willing to communicate and open to discuss. So I think good communication skills, you know, good, comfortable with, with talking, you know, in a team environment, you know, understanding uh, how you work together in teams is, is really a, we, you know, we don't really want to have these silos or individuals. We want to have people working together in a collaborative environment. So those are the kind of things that I think of as a, a agile modern workforce. Yeah, I would agree. So uh, we, we focus really heavily on, on both the production floor with our, with our operators. So we, we have a, a very strong uh, TPM program. So that back, back to the maintenance side of things. Uh, and, and really the idea there is, and you can take that principle and apply it across your entire organization, but but look across your production floor and look at how many technical resources you might have to, uh, to support your equipment. Well, if you can offset maintenance task and technical task, and, and it isn't just let me show you how to do this lubrication task or, or uh, this basic maintenance, how to replace a belt on a conveyor. No, I'm actually gonna teach you a little bit about how they work, because I think understanding the whys, again, it gets people's brain thinking. So, so you've now been able to take that, and that program's been in place for uh, almost 10 years now. Um, at, at a high level, and we've got production operators. Uh, we actually have some accredited trainers um, that are teaching th teaching the coursework uh, that's technically applicable towards uh, two years associate's degrees. And we now have people partnered, so we're growing technicians in our plant from uh, 
the, from the production floor. And as you mentioned, some of this is multi-generational. So you have people that, that maybe came from families where they never even assumed they could get a degree. Like that just wasn't in, the, in their, uh, their path, right? And, and now all of a sudden, all these things are possible. And operationally, so you have line leaders. And I always coached people like a manager isn't, isn't a boss rather isn't a leader. Leadership is something that anybody can have, right? If you're talking sense and you can get people to kind of uh, collaborate and work together and so look for those things we're, we're a social species get people working collectively and then they can see that's the human part the value that people bring um, and, and teach them those skills right so there's, there's things we can definitely build uh, I'd say the collaboration really extends to on like summer internships is really important from colleges uh, we, we get a lot of guys in fact I, I did want to give a shout out to Texas State we, we do have several of your industrial engineering graduates and they're really strong and, and the value of getting you know fresh ideas back in and challenging some of our uh, existing mentalities, and and, and uh, I think of three ladies that, that are work, work there now for us, and just come with a ton of energy, fresh ideas, and and you know enabling them to, you know, work coll uh, collaboratively. Right? I had an electrical engineering background. I learned a ton working with industrial engineers. Like, there's some overlap, but there's things you don't know, and you know, grouping engineers together, and 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 even you know managers and operators, and having everybody work in that collaborative space is is really, uh, I think, important to get get better knowledge and broader knowledge and, and the right answers, so. Well, thank you. Uh, we reached the end of, the, uh, of this panel. Uh, I want to thank all my, my guests for their, you know, very, very important uh, insights. So please give them a, an applause and thank you everyone for your time and keep enjoying the summit. <laughs>